almost the same way they get the same things wrong on rentals. If this is your first time to my channel, please forgive me because I am going to do the intro over because I'm going to be making two videos. Howdy. Welcome back to Dion Talk. When should you retire? This is actually something a lot of people get wrong. Almost the same way we get the buying a rental wrong. Almost everyone focuses on the math. A couple of months ago, about a month before, well, three months ago, about a month before I retired, I did a video on um, the cash flow on my properties. And in that video, I talked about how many rentals I have, uh, what the cash flow from each one was, what the expenses were. And it's, it's, I think in that video, I had this dawning realization that the math doesn't matter. When we look at a rental, most people think when they start looking at rentals, I have to understand the math. And we have to decide what math you're going to use. Are you using the 1% rule, which is flawed and outdated? Are you using cash on cash return or yield? Are you looking at cash flow? Sometimes people just focus on cash flow and they don't look at the yield. They just want to buy a property and then until the cash flow hits a certain amount. So they're not even looking at the yield. A lot of people do this with retirements too. And they think, I have to get the math right. And I, I usually ask this question when I'm talking with somebody new and, and they haven't really gotten far on the fire journey. They haven't absorbed a lot of content yet. They don't have the concepts down. So usually, or I'm talking to somebody who has literally never looked at their finances and I say, how much do you think it would take to retire? If you're familiar with my content, you know, it's not a number. It's an amount of money coming in that you don't have to sell your life for one hour at a time. Monthly passive income or close to passive. It can be dividends, stocks, running a business, getting it big enough to where somebody else runs the day to day. It can be uh, investing in real estate or REITs or syndications, you know, some form of real estate until you have income coming in that you don't have to work for. And a lot of people think in the beginning, I need to replace my W-2. And then as we progress further into knowing what we do about the FIRE journey, we realize we have a FIRE number. How much money do you spend every month? Not how much do you need to make? And we already have that data. It's kind of like looking at an internal rate of return. We can look at the last few years a lot easier than we can look at the next few years. So instead of thinking how much are you going to have to spend in retirement, and there are a few things you have to tweak, but you can actually look at your historical data. In the last six months to two years, you know, was that six to 24 months? How much were you spending? Look at your bank statements, your credit cards, and see this is how much it actually took me to live my life at this level. And then it costs more for healthcare. I've done a couple of videos on how to handle healthcare after you retire. It costs less to live, even though healthcare costs more, because while you were working, you were commuting, you were probably eating out, you um, had the vehicle maintenance and repairs, not just the time. You, you were saving for retirement. You were contributing the highest amount of taxes because earned income is one of the highest tax taxes that we have. So a lot of things become a lot less expensive in retirement, except for healthcare. So everyone's focusing on the math. And I've done this too. I've made several videos on here's how I run the cash flow because we're trying to figure out, should you buy a rental based on math? And we forget that when you look at a rental, the first thing is, does the math work? Because in any market, no matter what market you've chosen or what asset class you've chosen, if it would lose money, you probably don't want it. If it would break even and not get you a good yield, you probably don't want it. So after we look at the math and you determine for you what matters when it comes to math, for me, it's specifically, I want a better cash on cash return than the area average. And for the last 10 plus years in my area, area average was six to 8% on an uh, average return. And, and here's the simple math on that. I would look at 100 properties. 80 of them would lose money. The 20 that were left would make some money. Out of those 20, I would get the average. So there were 80% of the deals sucked still today. So I would look for 10% or better because six to eight was what I could find out of those 20 good deals. And then I would go for that. So I broke it down on math, what mattered for me. But that's just step one. With a rental, we have to then go, is this 
in the area that I want to invest? Is it a, a war zone? Because I, I invest between Tacoma and Olympia, Washington, but not in either city. And there are areas around there that I wouldn't own properties in, but they're in my search radius because you can't exclude a specific street in your auto searches with your real estate agents. At least I haven't figured out a way to yet. So I know to exclude those. Then I look at amenities. I want things on my properties that help limit tenant turnover, such as washer dryer hookups inside a unit, because if the tenants are using shared laundry or a laundromat, they're just waiting for another place to open up and turnover is expensive. I want at least two bedrooms and a garage in each unit because more space equals more stuff. More stuff means less likely to move. I like fenced yards because I like to allow pets because people don't also, also people don't like to relocate their pets. So I'm doing all of these things to limit tenant turnover on a rental. But a lot of people haven't looked past the math on retirement. What are the things that we consider? Because the majority of people get the idea of retirement wrong. On this channel, we should be looking at some of the same things. We're probably not looking at retirement accounts or Social Security or retiring at 65. Some of us are close to 65, so you might be retiring there and you, you can make it a better retirement. But some of us want to retire in our 40s or in our 30s or in our 20s and then make work optional. Retire doesn't mean you don't work. It means you don't have to work. So a lot of people are looking at pensions, which take 10, 20, or 30 years to acquire and can go bankrupt. There are people who have pensions from cities, you know, municipalities right now where the city is filing bankruptcy and they're getting less. There are unions that had to file bankruptcy and pensions went away. There are people looking at social security. One thing, they don't realize how small it's actually going to be. Second, they don't realize um, the difference between getting at 62 years or 67 years, having social security not really impact retiring early. And it could be a failing system. And then the, the worst thing that people do, to, in my opinion, and I've made videos on this too, so I'll back this up, not just by saying it's my opinion. Now this is my opinion forever. Retirement accounts suck. Long list of reasons would make an entire an entire video on that all by itself. So those are the three things the majority of people look at. Retirement accounts, Social Security, and pensions. None of those really help when you're talking about retiring early. So after math, there are several things to look at with a rental. Here's something that I don't think I've gone into much detail on, the things that we have to look at on retiring, whether it's retiring early. And retiring could be quitting the job that pays enough for you to save and invest and going for the job that you just thoroughly enjoy, but it doesn't pay very much. First, do you have a source of income that's coming in that is more than your expenses in multiples? This is what everyone focuses on, the math. What is my freedom number? And then I want to times that by three to five times. So if it takes you $5,000 a month to live, it's safe to retire when you're making fifteen dollars to $20,000 a month that you don't have to work for, right? You multiply what it costs you to live to have that buffer. We're still talking about math, the mistake that most people make. When you're looking at that income, is it diversified? If you've invested everything into stocks and you're using the bucket method, what happens if we have a 15 year stock collapse? If you're invested 100% in real estate the way I am, I don't own any stocks, I don't have a, a business, I just invest in real estate. Are all of my properties in one area where if Boeing moves away or a base shuts down, would I lose all of my income? Are all of my tenants in the military or all of my tenants working or all of my retenants on section eight? Are you? getting too much of your income from one source. So if you are invested in stocks, there is United States stocks, there's foreign stocks, there's index funds, there's like all these different things that I don't know and wouldn't talk about because I don't understand them, but you can diversify into a stock portfolio that way. If you're in real estate, I like to keep my properties at least 10 miles apart. I like small multifamily instead of a 10 unit apartment complex that's pulling all of its tenants from one source in the area or one area. I have duplexes, triplexes and fourplexes that are more than 10 miles apart. In most cases, I have two that are seven miles apart. Sometimes the deal's just good enough to go for it anyway. I diversify my tenant base. So I have one third military, one third section eight, one third working or retired. So something like a prolonged government shutdown, pandemic, or stock market crash can happen. My entire portfolio is not impacted. 
diversified sources of income. It can be all stocks. It can be your business. It can be all real estate, but make sure you diversify in that asset class so that if something happens, our worst case scenario is we have to go back to work. Like our worst case scenario when we are able to retire early is everyone else's day to day. But we don't want that. So now you diversify your income before you retire. So you're not pulling all of your money from one source. If you put all of your horses in one basket with a pension from law enforcement or military, and then something changes, at year 17, you're not allowed to re-enlist. At year 17, you make one mistake on a case that costs you your career, and now the pension's gone. So diversify your sources of income. Make sure we still meet the math. You want a source of income coming in or sources that is multiples of what it costs you to live every month. Your freedom number is just what it costs you to live. You multiply that to figure out how much you need, but then it's coming in from multiple sources. They talk about the average millionaire having seven sources of income. To me, that can be seven properties generating income. That's still seven sources as long as they're far enough apart and different types of tenants in each one. Second thing we need to look at that's past the math that changes in retirement and helps us make that decision of when should I retire? How much do you have in reserves? I have a very simple formula for figuring out reserves. When I had seven units or less, I kept $10,000 in an account. I figured a hot water heater could break, a couple tenants might not pay their rent, I might have to replace the roof, that reserve was sitting there. When I got more units up to 16 now, I increased my reserve up to 30,000. I figured a couple of roofs can go bad. More tenants might not pay their rent. There are you know, 16 water heaters that can go out at any time. So 30,000 helped while I had a, a job. When I decided to stop working, I would increase, and I did, my reserves up to $50,000. $50,000 in an account that is just there for emergencies. Shouldn't be used in day-to-day. -day. Everything above that should still be getting put to work to invest, to increase cash flow. So I don't just keep saving to, to increase that, uh, that SWAN account, sleep well at night. The bigger it is past $50,000, the more irritated we should be. So we've figured out we need to diversify the income. We need to increase our reserves. And then the third thing, and I steal this from Joe Kuhn, who has a YouTube channel here. Uh, his last name is K-U-H-N. He's 58, retired at 54, so he's been retired for four years now. He retired on stocks. He did use house hacking and you know these live and flip strategies to build his wealth, but he's invested in stocks and uses the bucket method. Um, so there are multiple, there's multiple ways to reach financial independence. There is no one right way, but there is a one right way for you. It might be stocks, it might be real estate, it might be a blend. But Joe talks about this, and I really took it to heart. And I was glad I found his content because this actually helped me pull the trigger on retiring. He says, retire to something, not from something. If you don't have something to retire to, I think then we risk, and this is not a problem for me, but there might be people out there who have this problem of getting bored. I've never actually been bored in my entire life. I spent months in the desert before desert storm and during desert shield and never once had a bored moment. Literally in the desert can totally entertain myself. Uh, so I haven't had that fear. But what are you retiring to? Because here's the other things you need to consider. Like with a rental, there's all of these aspects you want to consider. It's not just, is it going to make money? It's, it's am I going to have low tenant turnover? Is it in a place that's possibly going to appreciate? Like all these things you factor in, things that will make it a good investment. When we go to retire, you have to remember, a lot of our friends are gonna be working. So it's not like now where you work Monday through Friday and then you take the weekend and you call your friends and you say, hey, we've all been working all weekend and let's go out this weekend and do this. You have five days between the weekend when it's possibly just you or maybe one or two of your friends who've also figured out how to retire early. So what are you retiring to? What are you going to fill your time with? Are you ready for that time shift? Because one of my videos that I liked the most myself was multiplying your time, figuring out that most of us um, with work and commute and get ready for work and all of the things involved with that have you know, like five hours a day that's ours. And when you retire early, you turn that into 14 hours a day. That's yours. That's a big amount of time each day to, that you've multiplied. That's your time. And this really isn't something that I can comment on, but do you have a spouse? I haven't been able to pull that one off for a long period of time yet. Um, but significant other, a partner. Are you going to retire at the same time? 
are your retirement goals the same? One of you might want to travel. One of, one of you might be super lazy and want to just relax. Um, there's a lot to consider when it comes to when should you retire that actually have nothing to do with money. Money is the easy part. It's, it's, it's really easy once you have been doing it for a while to look at a rental and say, that's a good or a bad deal based on math. It's not that easy to look at it and then think of all of the other aspects, how much work needs to be done, uh, that neighborhood that, that it's in, noisy street, parking, like all of these things that you factor in, retirement's the same way. Math is kind of the easy point. What is your freedom number? What is a multiplier of that? That's as far as most people go. Now think, diversify that income, increase your reserves. What are you retiring to? Until you can answer these questions, what are you retiring to? For me, it was to help more people and to have time freedom. And I'm not a planner. One of the things that I really liked about reaching financial freedom is I've never had a budget. I don't want to have one now that I've retired either. Second, have you diversified that income that's coming in? Are you protected because it's not coming from one source that can go away? Third, do you have a spouse or a significant other or are you smart? One of those, and then are they on board with you? And does their timeline match yours? That was one of the struggles that my friend Dan recently went through, who was on my channel like two weeks ago now. He recently retired after four years of investing, and his spouse was retiring at almost the same time. And that was a challenge for them. And then the last question, think about this. If you can't answer this question, it might not be easy to know if you're ready to retire or not. How will you fill your time? A lot of people retire in their 60s and 70s. And there's a statistic out there that two years after retirement, most people pass away or have a heart attack or have a major health concern. And that's primarily because the majority of people retire in their 60s or later. But what is your life going to be like after you don't have a job? Are you going to start eating healthier? Are you going to have more time to work out? To quote Calvin and Hobbes, there's never enough time to do all of the nothing that we want to. But eventually, you're going to want to do something more than nothing. I'm going to take a minute here and get into the questions. Don't go anywhere. I'm going to end the video because I'm making a video out of this to play on its own because I get a lot of complaints from people that sometimes I have great topics on my long videos, but they see the three or the four hours and they don't even start. it. So don't go anywhere. Until my next video, thanks for coming to my Dion talk. Okay, for the few people who understood not to leave <laughs> that are still here. There might be a couple of surprise guests who pop in here today. I hope they do. I will be giving away a book, an audible version of 15 Conversations with Real Estate Millionaires by Michael Zuber. If you already have that book, you can choose a different audiobook. You do not have to do a super chat. So don't start doing super chats. Um, I'm going to, it depends on how many people show up. If not very many comments come, I have the 20 sided dice and I'm just going to roll through and pick a number out of the comments. I have a 60 sided dice. And I have a hundred sided die. So it depends on how many comments we get. But at the end of this video, so if you are on now and you leave, come back later and skip to the end and you'll see who won the audio, audible book. And it doesn't have to be 15 conversations with real estate millionaires. It can be whichever one that you choose. I would like it to be um, something finance related, but it doesn't have to be. And here's a, here's a bit of an overshare, which is early for an overshare for me. Right now, I think we're on day two of a four-day sale on Audible. So if you're watching this in Futureland, I'm sorry you got this late. But almost all Audible books are up to 85% off. I spent $400 yesterday on Audible books. Um, so hope maybe there's something on your list that you're looking to get. Tom, howdy. Rub the crystal ball and tell me when to quit. Well, you're, you're a CDL driver. Um, there's the other things I didn't really talk about in that video at the beginning of, do you hate your job? Do you love your job? I could have financially quit four years ago, worked four more years because I like the job. But 
do you like your job? And have you thought about all of those other things, Tom? Is it diversified income that's coming in? How are you going to fill your time? I need an awesome intro. I need to get with Matt and figure out how he did that. Howdy, Lauren. Welcome back. Michelle, howdy. REI Stoners, howdy. How many mortgages can a married couple have? Infinite. You can, after 10 mortgages in each of your names, the caveat there is you have to be able to put 10 in one person's name and 10 in the other. So there are some hoops to jump through. You then just switch to non um, Fannie Freddie backed mortgages. Like, how many mortgages do you think Michael Zuber had at 187 units? Um, so a lot of people get hung up on that. Between 2013 and 2016, lenders were capping people at four mortgages in your name. So if you were married, it would have been eight. So they usually just double it. But remember, if both your names are on a mortgage, that is a mortgage in each of your names. It counts against one of your four. You'd have to have each person on different mortgages. So I thought I would go to four because banks were smarter than me. And they figured that after the 2008 housing crash, they limited it to four so that less people would go through bankruptcy or have the you know financial issues. So once I got to four, I focused and paid one off. And then at another, my goal was to stay at four, but then two things changed. First, they switched to 10 mortgages in each person's name. And second, interest rates dropped significantly. So then I started working towards 10 mortgages in my name. Now, understanding how DSCR loans, asset-based lending works, uh, there are several fixed rate options that are a little bit worse uh, interest rate to where if I was still in growth mode and wanted to add a bunch of mortgages, I, would, I could have more than 10. It was just only 10 of them would be Fannie Freddie backed. And then another option is to go for seller financing. Doesn't usually count in those 10 or how many you can have in your name. Howdy, Tiffany. Ryan, howdy. Tennessee, Tweedy, howdy. Brian, howdy. Ray Stoners, how do you project what a property will make three to five years down the road? So generally, I don't. I don't project that far. I project the first year. That's what I'm looking at to determine if it's a property worth going after or not. So there's two real math formulas that I've used. One is a cash on cash return. So annual profit divided by cost to acquire for that first year. It's a lot easier to you know figure out area average rents, learn what your expenses are going to be for that first year to understand if it's going to be worth pursuing or not. When it's coming... When it comes to an internal rate of return, that's not something I would ever use going forward because you're projecting rent increases, you're projecting appreciation, you're projecting these things that we really can't control. An internal rate of return is best for looking at the last year. Cash on cash is best for next year. You can use cash on cash for last year too, but it's, it's to me, a lot more fun to use internal rate of return because you actually know things like how much was my appreciation? How much principal pay down happened? And what happened to my rents? Um, so I haven't projected more than a year in the future when buying a property, but I can tell you that based on all of my internal rate of returns, I average around 10 to 12% return first year on almost all my properties, except for one first year was 17%. It's just a great deal. Bought that in November of 2020 when everybody was saying, don't buy um, because nobody had to pay rent and you couldn't evict, but it's best performing property. But by year three of owning a property, almost all of the returns are over 20%. Like, I haven't seen it go down. It's entirely possible that it could. Remember, whenever we talk about rent, whenever I talk about rent, since we started tracking the data over 100 years now, in a five-year period, rents have never gone down market-wide. So that's a, that's a good quote that gives us confidence to be able to invest in real estate. But that's market-wide. If you owned rental properties in certain parts of Detroit when the car manufacturers moved away, or around Silicon Valley when the dot-com crash happened. Like there are markets that have crashed or you have a small town way out in the hills and the mill shuts down, the town dies. Like it's entirely possible for rents to go down. It's one of the reasons why I talk about diversifying your places, your locations and the tenant types. You have a massive stock market crash and a bunch of people get laid off. Generally doesn't impact the military. Doesn't, doesn't that was a great car, whatever that was. Uh, doesn't generally impact your um, Section 8 tenants either. And now you know why it was really hard to record an audiobook because I can't do it here. Eric, howdy. 
You mentioned on previous videos and debt to income that lenders said when two years on tax rental, they'll look at down payment. Can you please explain if you were referring to 20% down payment or if it can, and then a bunch of chats came in, oh, what's the rest of it? So let's see if I get the question here. So when I talk about rental income on tax returns, I'm not saying that that impacts down payment. It affects debt to income ratio. So when you first start out in your first two years, you're kind of risky to a lender. They don't know if you know how to run a business, how to find tenants, how to do things legally. So they usually look at your income specifically and say, this is how much debt to income you can have. After you have rental income on your tax returns for two years, that doesn't really impact your down payment. That's always based on the loan product and current lender fears um, and some other factors uh, like Oh, is it owner occupied? Is it single family versus um, triplex or fourplex, right? Like the type of property. So there's a bunch of details that can go to determining your down payment. What it does is it almost removes the debt to income ratio in the equation after two years. And all lenders are made different. I've had some lenders say, we never do that. And they actually use the word never, which is dumb because six months later, they don't know what their products are going to be. But they go, if you have rental income for two years, we'll consider 75% of rents in your, on, on your portfolio in your debt to income ratio. Some lenders have said, if the majority, which means 51%, so if you have three, you need two. If you have four, you would need three, right? It's like the majority of your leases have more than three months remaining, meaning they don't like month to month. They want three months remaining. Then they'll consider 75% of the rents of the property you are purchasing in your debt to income ratio. Still doesn't impact your down payment. That's all the other factors that I was talking about that hits that. But that's what makes investing so much easier after two years and how you get multiple mortgages. How people talk about uh, like RAI stoners, you know, how do you, they can like, have 10 mortgages in your name and 10 mortgages in your spouse's name. How can you do that if neither one of you work? So I retired from my job two months ago, called my couple of my lenders. So two, if you're watching Spencer, <laughs> you weren't the only one. And they told me I could still do anything I want on small multifamily or a rental. If I want to buy a owner-occupied single family, then they're going to look at my actual income from my rental portfolio and create a debt-to-income ratio for me. But if I'm buying a property that is a rental, 75% of those rents will count in my debt-to-income ratio. Basically, the sentence goes like this. You can borrow as much as you want as long as you come up with a down payment. That's That might be what you were referring to. So if you have to put 10 5% down for owner occupied the more you save the bigger property you could buy if you have to put down a 20 or 25% down investment loan now your down payment impacts how much you can borrow so it's not your debt to income that's going to be factored there that's where your down payment will control how much up the value of the property can be but that's part of it you also have to have reserves and some lenders will say, we want 4% of your portfolio in reserves. Some other lenders will say, we want um, three, my, my lenders have said three months of principal interest taxes and insurance on all of your properties in an account. Uh, some lenders want six months. So it's very lender specific. Howdy, Matt. Thanks for joining us. Anytime. Happy to do it. Nice. Kids are in I have, bed. Um, street race is going on outside my place. It's nice. Usually they only do it at like two in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't quite fit in a rent box. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't. And it's well, people don't come into our property at two in the morning either. <laughs> <laughs> so I did a video earlier on when it is time to retire. I don't know if you caught any of that, but it no, really was wasn't a 15 bed. minute slam on you. <laughs> it really wasn't. <laughs> I'll look at the abuse later on today. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, howdy, Indy. Howdy, Dividend Dave. How's the <laughs> move going? Tom, who is your camera person for the slides? My super chat is broken. <laughs> um, That's a secret. You would have to see a reflective surface to find out who that is. <laughs> <laughs> Good question, though. Um, <laughs> Elise, fire me, please. Howdy. And Eloa Construction, howdy. Levi, howdy. 
Can you expand on why you want a great deal related to your area? What if great is still only 1% cash on cash? What if bad far exceeds your cash on cash goals? Okay, I can expand on that. So I talked about learning my area average, which in my area was uh, six to eight percent, and I shot for tens, right? Mm -hmm. If the area average here was negative four percent on every property, I would not be shooting for two percent negative, right. right? That's when I would look at a different asset class. I would expand the concentric circles around the city until I found an equilibrium where rents and prices started to balance out, mm -hmm. or I turn into mill millennial Mike, house hack in the expensive area, and then invest out of state in it, or or in another part of the state. Like my brother invests in California. A lot of people say I can't invest. I live in California. It's too expensive. He's right on the edge of LA County in Kern County, where prices are a third what they are in LA County and the rents are about the same. Like it's a great place to invest. Wow. So I would adjust based on that. So I do have a minimum threshold on what would be, I don't know what it is. I think if my my area was six to eight and it started looking like five to seven in the last year, maybe, I was thinking of adjusting down to eight or nine. I would probably go to all the way down to a 6% cash on cash return in real estate and still figure that the internal rate of return would justify that as being a, a worthy investment. But 5% or less in my area, I would start looking at distance and make sure I still incorporated house hacking. House hacking becomes more important in an expensive area. Yeah. Hey, Chester, howdy, Larry, howdy. And then Laura, who won a audiobook last week. So Matt, this week we're doing an audiobook. doesn't take a super chat. I'm just gonna go off the comments. Okay. It depends on how, how many we get on which die I use. And I think I saw <laughs> a super chat come in. Dividend day. Paying for this video, this is a tax deductible, right? <laughs> Put it in the quote and it is. Remember the, the right question isn't, is this a tax deduction? The right question, do you, do you remember what it is, Matt? How do you make it a tax deduction? How do I make this a tax deduction? I didn't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> I'm fine. Okay. I promise I won't wilt like a flower. <laughs> <laughs> right. Put a flower in here. Weird. Um, REI stoners. I think Mindy says a Roth IRA is good to max out every year at 6K. Correct. Mindy, who's still working. Love her to death. It's great. I, love, I watch all of her content, but still working. Like, if you want to work until you retirement age, 59 and a half, sure, put stuff into a retirement account. Because then the follow-up, the worst advice that comes out is put money in a Roth so you can self-direct it and buy real estate, turning passive income into active income and losing the benefits of owning real estate. Like if somebody wants to retire after 59 and a half, and maybe if they have the cash flow that's four or five times their cost of living, maybe put money into a retirement account, diversify in different strategies. My stance is if I had, a, I want to say a penny, but I still have some money in my last retirement account I need to yank out. If I had put money in a retirement account, I'd still be working. So that's my litmus test this year of, should I have refinanced my house last year like Matt and Mike suggested? I'd still be working. Should I have recycled capital? Should I have put money into a retirement account? I'm, I'm going to judge all kinds of things on, I don't have to work. Right? You would not be working. If you, if you loaded up that one house with debt, you would not be working. So stop. That's not true. You'd have less to live on, but you'd spend nowhere near what you make anyway. Go ahead. Tell me I'm wrong. I, I, I think you're wrong. <laughs> Write that down. I thought Matt was wrong. We're back in the real world. So, so simple math off the top of my head. Yeah. Passive income's a little higher than 14,000. Right. Takes me around four to live. Yep. And, you know, I'm going to say five because I want to goof off more now, right? Sure. Yeah. Sounds good. And so Nine. that's not quite three times my freedom number. That's not. If I refinanced that house, I would have lost 2000 a month in cash flow. So that would have took yep. me down to 13, seven, 12, seven 000. net, seven so more net. Step right. I still would be working. I wanted closer to three times. But you wouldn't be because, because you spent the last four years stacking. I'm just saying. <laughs> Invest to wealth. Sorry, everybody, for the sidebar argument, but <laughs> I think it was great. <laughs> Invest to wealth. How are you? At least fire me, please. Don't forget to hit the like button. An angel needs its wings. I That's agree. true. It's true. I got Zuber saying that now in his updates. That's cool. Finally, I kind of got a thing of it going. <laughs> yes. Said it in every video for like two months straight. That's awesome. 
Monica, howdy. How do you do numbers for a fourplex for maintenance? Vacancy repairs when you're buying a property, when you're doing your cash on cash return. So not, I'll let you go first if you like, Matt, but I have an answer too. No, I mean, I, I mean, kind of, um, I don't change that number um, when it goes duplex, tri or quad. It's still a percentage. And so for me, I, um, so the way that I did it in the beginning was there was a reserve. It was just 10% and that's what, it, that's what happened. And then after I got to probably 10 or 12 properties, then it was, I'm just put, I have way too much dead money just sitting there. So then I started the reverse model, which was, it was 10% for all that time, stack of cash, got to 50,000 bucks. And then it was 55,000 and then 60 and then 70. And it was like, okay, now I'm able to buy a whole nother house with my emergency fund or maintenance fund. And so what I did was I reversed it at that point. And then I started looking at what are my annual maintenance costs? And then I would take that number and I would divide it by the number of units. And then that was the percentage that I started sticking away because I still had my 50K buffer. So even now when I count it, now we're probably like 3%, but that's a real number. That 3% is a real number because it's based on, but a 43 building 124 unit portfolio. So admittedly, you don't do that on the first 10. The last 10 are nothing like the first 10. So I would do 10%. And I think that that's probably enough um, in the beginning as you as you roll to your whatever number. Almost exactly the way I look at it. Um, it's a percentage of gross rents up to yeah. four units. I think if you start buying a 10 unit or 20 unit, there might be some other metric that yes. I don't know. So I'm not going to talk on. Mm -hmm. But with four units or less, I do a gross percentage of rents. And that's 10% for repairs and maintenance and 5% for vacancy, which is really lumped together because on a vacancy, there's a tenant turnover that's gonna require repairs and maintenance. So 15% is set into an account. Every time I buy the property, I run the numbers like I had to do that. Yeah, I had my reserves at, when I had seven or less units at 10,000 up to 16 units, I had up to 30,000. And then when I retired, I increased that to 50,000. One of the things that was part of the, the video earlier on how to know when to retire is when you've increased your reserves to just, you know, to, to justify the sleeping well at night when you're not making money. So at 50,000, I, I look at a property, I run the numbers, even though the 50,000 is full, like the 15% had to be taken out to figure out if it's a good return or not. When I buy it, that 15% doesn't come to me since the 50,000 is full. And then I have, you know, 15% more rents to spend every month because then I would need it to live. That 15% continues to build the investing fund. The money above $50,000 is always rolling into the next investment. Anytime the $50,000 is used for something, 15% of gross rents from all of the properties go into that account to fill it up. It's actually not happened because yeah. cash flow handles all of the problems as your portfolio grows. The first few rentals are much harder than when you have five or six. Um, so I hope that helps. If you just run it as a percentage, even if your reserve is full, would the property stand on its own? Even, and then that money just goes into the investing account. Yeah. Tom, is vacancy higher on a fourplex compared to a single family house? In my experience, no. If you have a, a, a square cube where no one has parking and it, it's like living in an apartment, I would think it would be higher. One of the reasons, Tom, that I'd like to have my side-by-side -side units is because you don't have tenants living above or below another. So even my fourplex and my triplex, they're all side by sides. Um, my hi highest turnover has been in my single family house. And that was somebody inherited a house and moved out. Um, what's that, your experience been, Matt? But that's something like uh, when some of these channels say a 400% increase in, you know, in, uh, in defaults, right? Which is just like, it's an anomaly. It really like it's it's just an anomaly. It's a specific situation in your case for that single family home, so that's kind of an anomaly, right? Um, I think that yes, only because you have four times the number of tenants. So that's why. Is it four times as likely? No, but is it more likely? Absolutely, because you have the it's it's math. You have four people that are paying rent versus one family that's paying rent. Um, it's, but it's not one of those things where, you know, I have a four, I, one of my four units that I actually just raised all the rents in 
um, without the binder strategy because I was okay if they left. You were, um, you were saying that might be a good thing. And I'm, I'm half considering that. I've got three units of this fourplex that I'm going to talk yeah. quietly. You can hear me. <laughs> but yeah, uh, turnover would be great sometimes. But yes. I, yeah, I'm going to binder strategy these three tenants. So. I literally had one of the tenants scream at me. And he's like, this is ridiculous. For a one bed, one bath, he's paying $800 a month. The rent has been raised in five years since I bought the building and market is 1400. Section eight is 12 and a quarter. So hang on, you purchased it how many years ago? Almost five. And you haven't raised the rent for five years? Nope. You trained the tenant not to expect the rent increase. I did, what was pandemic? And that's why I didn't raise the rent. Uh, I didn't okay. raise the rent. Yeah. So that was the only, so the only pause that we took was in 2020 and 2021, we took a pause. The only, rain, the only rents that we raised were ones that people moved out and new tenants came in. We went to market, but on none of my existing tenants in 20 and 21 did I raise rents. And I wait until their lease was over. Basically, most of my leases expire in May and Ju- or April, May and June. And so that's when we started making all those overtures to, out towards people. These folks are all month to month. And uh, quite frankly, you know what? They, I didn't. I wasn't, from my perspective, we were also putting, making them put the utilities in their name too. It was just outrageously cheap. The right. funny That's thing an is, increase too, yeah. Yeah, the funny thing is, is that the the guy who sold the property, he had to sell it because he said it doesn't make any money. It doesn't make any money because he was a bad business person. It didn't make any money because well, he would never raise people's rents. I love his content, but that's Graham Stephan's problem. He says, I agreed, have these rentals, they're not performing agreed. very well because I haven't raised the rent in 10 years, or I could just stick it in the stock market and make 5% and it's way better. I'm like, well, you set that up. Yeah, he he was, he, hey, Graham, you were the problem there. <laughs> right, and he owns that. He said it in his own videos. He, it, he, it, and, the, and I'm sure he knows that. But yeah, for us, we there are people, when you're a great tenant from us, we buy, we use the binder strategy, our version of it, we use that. When When you're somebody that's been there for five years and you're screaming, complaining about rent, I have no problem just giving you the rent increase. And if you stay, fine, you'll pay it. And if you don't, then that's fine too. Bye. I might help you pack. Howdy, Alizette. Thank you very much for the super chat. It's much appreciated. Um, Salud, Dad. You have tequila water. I have, um, what is this, Vodka Mountain Dew? (laughs) Cheers. That's water. It's good water. When running the numbers, if I plan to utilize FHA 3.5% down, do I run as if I'm putting down 20%? How do I find current property taxes? Um, I'll let you go first, Matt. I have an answer for this too. Yeah, so tax. So I would just look up the tax card. Um, if you, you can look at particularly any town or any county, it depends on how it's broken down in your state, but you can typically look at town and county and you can actually look it up or you can always look at an address um, typically the Zillow listing will have it. If it's an active listing, if it's not an active listing or it hasn't been listed recently, you can actually just call the town and ask them if you, if you find a property that's, if you're looking for something more reliable, get used to looking things up on the tax map uh, for your city and almost all cities, uh, many towns too, actually have that online. So that's what I would do from a tax perspective. Okay. There were two questions there. I'm gonna answer the tax one first and then I'll go back to the first one. For the tax, what I would do is go to your county website or contact your county tax assessor and ask them what percentage of the property value did they use when calculating? Because when you purchase a property, you're going to create a factual event that changes their opinion of what the property value is. So if you know the percentage that they're using, you can kind of calculate what that increase is going to be. Not real perfectly, but you know that it's going to go up. The second part of your question was, you're putting 3.5% down with FHA. This is the same problem somebody has if they use VA and put zero down. It's very easy to look like you have a really good return if you put a little bit of money down. So whenever I'm using a house hack, I run the numbers and I do two things. Both do the same thing. I take out the house hack. I run the numbers as if it's after I've moved out and all of the units are rented. So you're, you're, you're not calculating that you live there. The rent is reduced. So that would impact your yield. I'm looking at all of the rent. Of, from all of the units. And the second is, you're right. I calculate it as if I did 20 or 25% down 
whatever amount I would be doing on the investment properties that I'm buying so that I can line them up apples to apples and see which one's the best one to go after. And then benefit from FHA by having the lower down payment, the better interest rate. Maybe look at conventional though, uh, Lizette, if, if you don't, ha if you haven't owned a property for the last three years, conventional will only be 3% down. If you do own a property and you have owned it in the last three years, it's only going to be 5% down for a single family house, house with an ADU and for some lenders, a duplex. Yeah. And with a conventional loan, your mortgage insurance automatically goes away when you hit 22% equity without having to refinance with FHA and mortgage insurance lasts the length of the loan. So you only have three options, sell it, refinance it, or pay it off. So conventional is usually better. Remember, FHA doesn't mean first time home buyer. It's confusing because it's an F and an H. It means federal housing authority. And it's designed to help people get on the property ladder if your credit sucks and your debt to income sucks. Almost all other times, conventional is better unless you buy a triplex or a fourplex. That's where the 3.5% down across the board for all four really starts to stand out. Yes. The other thing too on that tax piece is look at what the way your state does it, because in many states, it's different. They actually don't base it on the sales price. In California, as an example, they base it on the sales price. In New Hampshire, they base it on the assessed value. So if I pay $500,000 for a property, but it's only assessed at 350, the taxes don't go up when I buy it for 500. They stay at the assessed value. So find out how your county does it. Yes, very much so. I hope that helps, Eliza. Thank you for that. Lauren? Howdy. It was really nice meeting you at the Tacoma FI meetup the other day. Glad you were able to work that out. That was really cool. And I'm going to try to be as PC about this as I can. Oh, no. What are your thoughts about investing in Lakewood or east side of Tacoma? Lakewood is very divided. You have a very affluent area that was like the Linda Evans movie stars all around there. And then you have the, and this, I'm going to try to be politically correct, the leeches that form around a military base so not the military housing but the, the mm -hmm. bad elements of i don't know what it is but around every military base you have a section of town you just don't want to go to so parts of lakewood are really bad i own a duplex in lakewood it's not in the super rich part and it's not in the really bad part it's right by lake steelacombe so it's kind of nice it was a good rental but here's why i hate lakewood flip that town off right now if it would make everybody watching think i was talking to them Lakewood is the only town I invest in, and I invest in, you know, around Tacoma and Olympia and Yelm and Spanaway and all these cities around here, but Lakewood's the only one that has a rental housing authority that charges you a whopping $12 a year. It's not much per unit, right? But they send out an inspector who was 19, had no training, and basically harassed my tenants, picked on me because my soffit was different color on one side of the duplex to the other, um, and then made the tenants switch out a light switch cover because it was a Disney princess and that light switch cover didn't match all of the other ones in the unit. Um, not my favorite town. Only duplex I own in Lakewood. I don't know that I would sell it because of that, but I'm not looking to buy there again. East Tacoma, yes, as long as you could stay away from anything near McKinley Street, right down that word, M-K. M-C. McKinley. Yeah, everything around McKinley is a war zone. Like the cops aren't allowed to go there alone. So you don't want to own a rental there. And there's a bunch of fourplexes around there that come up for sale at a really good price. Don't wow. drive by it before you make an offer. That's the one area that I would go and check out first. Um, but the rest of East Tacoma, I, I think, have two rentals in East Tacoma. Um, it's a big area because it's unincorporated, East Tacoma. Uh, great. As long as you're not near McKinley Avenue. So good questions. And I hope you are enjoying the two audiobooks that you won last week. Derek, howdy. When analyzing deals, is the 1% rule outdated? I ask because I'm considering a duplex that is listed for 210, rents are only 1500, but room for increase. Would you like to answer that? Because I have a good answer on a video I made too. So, but you first, Matt. 1% rule, absolutely not. It's completely outdated, doesn't make any sense. Most properties don't make, no. 1% rule, throw it out. It's not even a thing anymore. 
Absolutely. Not one of my properties has ever met the 1% rule. Some of them I don't even think after owning for three years when they have better than a 20% cash on cash return still don't meet the 1% rule. The 1% rule made sense in 2010, 2011, and 2012 when they had millions of foreclosures to filter through to look for the best deals. Not the not the deal that was great, but the best ones to filter through. That was when the 1% rule made sense. If you find a 1% rule right now, it's probably going to be in a war zone, high turnover, very risky area to invest in. Um that's a great question. 210,000 for rents are 1500. I'm guessing that's both sides put together with room for improvement. So you could probably get 900 each side, take up to 1800 without too much difficulty, probably using the binder strategy. Um, not knowing anything but the math. And remember, I don't know if you were here at the beginning of this, Derek, but one of the biggest mistakes people make with retiring and when should I retire is focusing on the math only. Math is step one. We have to focus on it. Buying a rental, math is step one. We want to make sure it's going to get a return. But is it in a safe area? Are there amenities like washer and dryer hookups and a garage and things that are going to help limit tenant turnover? Is it side-by-side -side unit instead of over-under unit? I mean, things that can actually impact it that have nothing to do with the math. And the last thing to wrap up about the 1% rule, when we had millions to filter through, it kind of helped narrow down how many to look at. Mm -hmm. Does your market currently today have thousands of deals to filter through, let alone millions. Most of us are looking in our in our buy box uh, between five and 50 probably units that pop up in, in a given month. So it doesn't take that much filtering through. So for math, for me, it's cash on cash return or yield, cost to acquire. No, take that back. Annual profit divided by cost to acquire. Um, there's a little bit more to it than that. And we have a couple of videos on both of our channels. Did I even introduce you? Because <laughs> there might be somebody here who's who's not familiar with the three amigos. There's the three of us, and or the I R E I Avengers, who one seen. of those might show up in ten minutes. <clears throat> um, cool. Welcome to my channel. I'm so rude, Matt, the lumberjack landlord, who lives in Siberia or somewhere near Boston, Cow Hampshire, has 121 units. Last count, I think you changed it now. 124. Yep. 124. 124 43 buildings. Yep been investing for over 20 years so you've lived through the 2008 housing crash did. Um, and then the thing that you like to harp on the most that i don't think matters at all is that you only went to the ninth grade i think that's <laughs> not a irrelevant thing because i guarantee i didn't learn anything after the ninth grade that's helped me in any way it's only to give I, people context <laughs> i only went through with a 1.1 gpa to sneak into the marine corps that's the only reason i finished high school yeah and i did it two days a week nice I had two jobs and went to high school and my, and all my classes, except for like the required ones were teacher's assistant. So you didn't miss much. Yeah. I was going to say mine was purely, it's purely for con. It's purely contextual. Cool. Um, I don't think I missed any of the super chats. Go back up here to the questions again, Matt, really thank you for showing up and of course, <laughs> I'm I'm I hope I introduce you sooner. Like it's we're what? I'm not sensitive. A ways into it. Not sensitive. You're crying. I can see it. Exactly. Deep down on the inside. I am. Really deep. Michelle, can't wait to be bored. Poor me. <laughs> Howdy. Or nope. Just more time for reading and flying. Exactly. Strider. Howdy. How are you doing, Mr. Retirement? It is. I tried to put it into an, a video. I think, I don't know if it was a week or two ago. Uh, you know, re retired feels like. And the quote, the closest I can equate it is better than winning the lottery. Because. <laughs> Think if most people won the lottery, you know, I'm saying $10 million, right? Sure. So not like 50 grand, I mean, $10 million. Mm -hmm. What would they do tomorrow? Whatever they wanted. They might work. They might not. They might travel. They might not. They, they can go eat at any restaurant. And I have to look at the thing. They can get any vehicle they want. Mm -hmm. That's what they would do, right? It's what I could do. Mm -hmm. I'm not super rich. I'm not going to go buy five Lamborghinis. I could pay cash for one, but I'm not going to buy another rental, right? 70% um, of lottery winners are broke within five years. Yes. Same with like I mean, the, the sports ball players that you watch. Basketball players. They're the ones right. within five years basketball. of getting out. They're, 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 yeah. they're broke. Yeah, like if you reach financial freedom, a lot of people say, well, it's that pride of I did that myself, right? It's not, it's, it's the peace that comes from knowing if somehow I lost it all. Here's the steps it would take for me to in five to 10 years, be financially free again and never have to work again. Like that's what makes it better than winning the lottery. It's true. Mad 76. Howdy. A name I saw from your live stream on Sunday. Yeah. Okay. All your videos and mats. Awesome. 
Cool. Sorry, I wish I was more entertaining. <laughs> I think we have great information. I just don't we know, all? <laughs> don't we all? Exactly. <laughs> Sergi, Sir, Sir, Sergey. Oh, I see. Tom Della. Do you ever buy properties with fairly high HOA condo fees? No. No. I don't buy them if they have a dollar HOA fee. Yeah. So that's one of my search criteria. No HOAs, no condo fees. Matt has a great story that you please share with us on your um, random assessment. Yeah, that was that's a horrible story. <laughs> but thanks. Let's talk about that. So <laughs> Cheers. I bought I bought a property. Cheers. It was I bought a property. It was a house hack. It was where I wanted to live. Um, and so it was a really cool condo. And um, I thought I had solved the world's problem. I used to be a house hack E. Then I became a house hacker, meaning that I was the one buying it. I used my roommate and my lease, my lessee to actually get use his $1,000 a month of rent to help get qualified for the property. I get qualified for the property. And after being there about 18 months, I get a letter in my mailbox in the building saying, quick note, there's been a special assessment done against the building. It's $4 million and your share is 70,138 bucks. <laughs> $70,000. And I was in a, I was in that building at 23, 23 years old. I just, yeah. Yeah. All the words that you can imagine came out 70. I didn't have that anywhere near that money. Nowhere even close. So I had to basically just start listening and finding out. And so when that happens um, and it was a big surprise, it was a builder mistake. And that builder was out of business. And so we couldn't sue him for it. We were going to have to pay it. And so literally as that process goes through, thank God the market went up for a couple of years. I was able to sell the property, walk away, not owing anything. Basically them taking on the idea that there would be a special assessment um, fully disclosed. But that actually took all of the profit from my very first deal was a special assessment that I had no control over. I, I bought the building when I bought into the building, it was 20, uh, 20, about 20 years old, 18 to 20 years old. And so no idea this was coming. The board hadn't discussed it at all. It wasn't in any of the meeting notes. The realtor that sold me had no idea. It was completely out of left field. So I lost all of, I would have been out of pocket, but instead I lost all of my profit on that deal for three years. I lost all of my profit. And then it just became a very expensive rental. That's what I got out of it. It was a very expensive rental. So your story it, it helps me understand for myself why I wouldn't want to invest with an HOA because of random 100%. assessments. Here's the, yep. here's the two reasons from personal experience. Well, not really. One's personal, one's a friend. Why I would never own a rental in an HOA. No matter the numbers. Yes. Um, my personal experience is uh, I had a house in an HOA. The HOA board is generally... Not always. You might be the exception if you're on one. Full of a bunch of people who have nothing but better to do but have time to mess with their neighbors. And if you're not in the good old boys club, you can't do things other people can. But the second thing is I had a friend who had a rental. Five years. Had a tenant in place for five years. Tenant moves out. The CCNRs for the HOA said 20% of units were allowed to be rentals. They hadn't been tracking it. It was above 30%. So he was not allowed to put another tenant in. His choice was move in or sell or leave it vacant. No. HOAs are off the list of ever buying in. I will, so that was my horrible HOA story. My favorite HOA condo fee story. I bought into a building, but before the other owners would know, I actually had lined up other units and I closed on them within 24 hours of each other. And I became the majority and I changed our condo fee structure by myself because I was the majority owner. Nice. That's my cool HOA story. I have heard of investors that get very involved in their HOA. And it, it works out great. But the risk of the HOA deciding to replace a fence that had nothing wrong with it, and all of a sudden you've got a $20,000 commitment to whatever they're doing. Yep. I, yep. I would not have bought into that building had I not had three different blocks of units that I was buying all lined up with each other, which gave me, as soon as I closed that week, it gave me the majority share. James J. Howdy. Thank you for the super chat. I 
I don't see a question. I just want to make sure I'm not missing it. I'm hoping that we can get better at sometimes they'll come out not quite at the same time. But I appreciate that. You said, thanks for the great content. As always, I appreciate that. And then underneath that, I saw Beth Traverso. Howdy. Hey, Beth. Who needs to come here on a come on on a Tuesday and be a part of a live stream. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she has a technology. She could even join just like this. She could. Do I have the technology to share this link? Yeah, yeah. Sure. I, I mean, am I, I good can, enough to do that? Yeah, yeah, I can show you. <laughs> okay. Um, Nicholas Masting, howdy. Do you lo allow co-signing? If so, any info on your requirements would be great. I do. Um, there's a couple uh, clauses in the lease on severability, making sure the entire lease is binding. Um, so I've got some roommate situations where parents have co-signed for one who didn't qualify. Uh, but the lease is for always for the whole amount of the rent, not for that roommate's portion of their rent. Uh, so you might have to spell out, this is the aggregate rent. You guys work out who's paying what amount beyond that, but you're all responsible for the whole amount anytime the amount isn't paid. Um, do you allow co-signing that? Absolutely not. Not even for college students? Nope. I refuse college students parents co-signing hmm. but little jimmy i don't care about little jimmy don't care i will little jimmy has a problem little jimmy can be a big boy and he can call his landlord i will talk to little jimmy he's my tenant you are not so little jimmy shows up with a 500 credit score but mom says i have a 720 and i'll sign not interested because i uh, on it, yeah not interested i don't want to i have no interest in having those conversations with parents because i did it the problem that I had was I had a couple of units and their parents were very involved. And every time there was a problem, I got a call from mommy and I don't have to deal with mommy. I deal with the kids because huh. it, they're the ones paying the rent. And if mommy's paying it for them, that's fine. But my tenant is the tenant. It's not mommy. It's not daddy. I'm not having that call. I, that woman. And then subsequently the, the next year later, it was a dad. Nah. Mm -mm, okay, so based on your experience, you're a yeah. no, I'm a yes. Nice. Yep, I'm a hard no. All there. Howdy. And more. Howdy, do you know when to increase rents? How do you know when to increase rents? I'll let you go, Matt. Oh, no, all you. You got this. Okay. This one's easy. So there's only one factor that sets your rents. Your expenses have nothing to do with rents. What the tenant was paying for their rent last year has nothing to do with the rent. And here's how I would justify that. Let's say you have a rental and they've been tenants been in there for 10 years. You finally make your last mortgage payment. You no longer have the expense of principal and interest. Are you going to call your tenant and lower the rent by a thousand dollars? No. Right. So the, the a mistake that I often see in the Facebook groups and in the bigger pocket community is somebody says, I want to raise my tenants on, I want to raise the rent on my tenants, but they're good tenants. And a whole bunch of virtue signalers jump in and go, if your prices didn't go up, if your your interest and your or your property taxes and your insurance didn't go up, you shouldn't raise the rent. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Third dumbest thing I've ever heard. I've heard I do twice. So if you base it on your expenses, you're you're leaving out inflation. Your handyman's wages are going to cost more. That has nothing to do with your insurance. That has nothing to do with your property taxes. Area, average, rents, set, rents. You might not have to do a rehab, so you might be a little below that. And if you have a tenant move out and you do a full rehab, you might be trying a little bit above that because it's a nice, clean unit. But area, average, rents, set, rents. Look at your area. The, the binder strategy, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, um, Mr. Moore or M. Moore, Ms. Moore, not sure. Um, on this channel here on Dion Talk Financial Freedom, look up the binder strategy. There's a five minute video that gives the concept and then a 20 minute video that literally classroom style breaks down the concept of how to raise the rents once you've decided to. But it can also be flipped and a tenant can lower their rent using the binder strategy. If you're renting for $1,000 a month and the area, all of the units exactly like it in your area are renting for $1,500, it's going to be easy for you to get your tenants to ask for you to raise the rent to twelve or $1,300. So the area average rents got your rents to go up. If you have a unit and it's rented out for $1,000 a month and every unit in that area is rented for $500 a month, the tenant should be contacting you and showing you a binder and getting you to lower the rent. So that's what you do. how you know if you want to raise or lower rents as you look at all the rents in the area. 
what does it take? And you might look on apartments.com, Zillow, Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, all the different platforms that you can find like you were trying to run into place. Same number of bedrooms in your area. How much do they rent for? And that will tell you how much you should low, raise or lower, which I've never seen, but it could be a thing. If you live in an area where all the economic drivers move away, all of a sudden you might have to lower rents to keep somebody there or to pull in the next person. So that's how I know more is what are area average rents in comparison to my unit. REI Stoners, follow up to your question. So a husband and wife would buy the property together with W-2 earnings, but put the mortgage under one of their names. The problem there is the person who puts the mortgage under their name has to be the, able to qualify for that entire mortgage. So what a lot of people that I've worked with that have done is they, they get two or three rentals together with both names on the mortgages. They have rental income coming for a couple of years on both of their tax returns. And then one of them starts buying a small multifamily using just their name. So you might not end up with a perfect 20 mortgages in your name, but that's years down the road. But you can get more than 10 that way by getting the rental income on your tax returns so that your debt to income ratio is not the barrier and it takes two years. So the first few, you buy together. Yep, I agree. Cool. Michelle, howdy. Happy to report the second unit in the duplex I closed on. Thanks to all learned from you. Will be rented soon. I screen applicants very objective, like a business. Good, perfect. And legally protect yourself to make sure you're screening it like a business too. Yes. You wouldn't say something on a, you know, a public forum at like YouTube of saying, I deny college students. Tom. Do you understand Matt's deal with the $7,000 escrow for repair? I do not. I can share. Please do. So the way that I structured the deal was basically it was a 50-40-10. So let's just call it for even numbers, uh, $300,000. Or let's call it $100,000. So Or $200,000. That was split evenly, nicely. So $200,000. So $100,000 is what Velocity is going to pay for the first mortgage. The holder is, or the note holder who is the owner is going to hold $80,000. And I'm going to put $20,000 in as my down payment plus closing costs. The 7,500 comes into play because on that $100,000 that Velocity is going to write them to take out their, their note, to take out their mortgages, they only owe about $92,500 on their mortgages. So there's a $7,500 left over my structure in the deal said, okay, you're going to get my 10%, which is 20,000 bucks. That 7250, that stays behind in an escrow account to take care of your roof, your heating system, a big major expense. That was one of the things where they weren't going to see, they would see that money, but they're already getting the cash infusion that they need based on the fact that they're not going to have a mortgage anymore based on the fact that they're going to carry the note and I'm paying them that note for the cash. And so to me, I said, I need to have some level of protection because the income on this deal, while it might be 10% or 11%, the income on this deal is not very good. It's a horrible, generally speaking, it's not a very good deal for me because I can put the money together in a duplex and I can get a 20% return, a dupe or try or a quad. In this single family home, which is really tough to cash flow in, in New Hampshire, it makes sense for me to help these folks out and do the deal because I can, but it's not a great deal. So I just have to have some protection to the downside. And that's why that 7,500 bucks will stay in escrow for only the 10 year IO period of the deal, just as a buffer. That way, if the roof needs replacing, it's 10 grand. If the furnace needs replacing, it's 10 grand. I'm still going to be money out of pocket, but there's at least a little bit of a buffer there because they've also had some delayed maintenance that they just hadn't taken care of in the last two or three years as they were fighting with the bank. Does that make sense? It does. It sounds like finding out, finding out what mattered to the seller. Correct. So, and then structuring it in a way that protected you. Correct. Yeah, yeah. They wanted to basically be able to come to the table and not have to pay anything and basically just get a check from me. So I said, that sounds fine. And here's what all the rates are, but I need a little bit of a, of, a, of a maintenance buffer in there because their furnace is 25 years old. Their roof is 15 to 20 years old. And they said, well, they don't need replacing. They don't need replacing now, but I have a 10 year IO note with you. And the next 10 years, I promise you, one of the two of those is going to fail. And when they do, I'm not asking you to kick in any money because now I own the property. I just need a buffer there sitting there. And I said, hey, 
if the roof stands up and the heating system stand up and we get to 10 years and the IO is done, if that money's still in there, I will give it to you. That's what was, that's what we wrote in the contract. It's just not going to be there because I already saw the condition of the roof and I saw the condition of the heating system. Right. They're not going to last 10 years. One of them is going to go. So that's the structure. Howdy, flash of light. Thank you for the super chat. Um, tenant goes on vacation for two weeks. There's a leak in between the walls that has been there a while. Whoa. What do you do now that you suspect mold? So first, you suspect mildew. Sure. Unless you're a mold specialist and you've had it tested. Anytime there's mold or mildew or anything like that, you just eliminate the source of water. You might, what if it's open, apply fans to dry it out. But as long as it's not continuing to get water, it isn't going to be an issue. Right. That's that's how I've handled those. And I live in Washington where we're underwater half the time. Yep. The other thing too is, is that most rules, and look up what your local ordinances are, but most rules will allow you to clean up and you don't know that it's mold. It might be mildew. You have no idea what it is, but most of them will let you self-remediate that um, if it's not more than X amount of contiguous feet. So that's one of the things that I would look up because in a lot of states, it's like six feet or eight feet, but look at your local law. Tennessee Tweedy, love the episode the Three Amigos did on Section 8 rental increases. My triplex should be renovated by Q1 of 2023. Awesome. We'll diversify my tenant base to include Section 8. Awesome. Awesome. Nice. Yeah. Clinton, howdy, Indy, howdy. They're saying hi to Matt, Michelle, Ronald yeah. Zion, howdy, Lumberjack, Ryan, nice. hi, Matt. And then yeah. chat moved. A lot. Um, you know how heavy truck tires are, by the by? I did four of them this morning. They weigh a freaking ton. Fun. Not really. Tennessee Tweedy says, I skipped a question. Oh. So hard to I get see. good interviewers these days. I know. Can't find good help. <laughs> it's so difficult. I'm scrolling up to see because I'm going to say, okay. Can you tell me about your branding strategy for your real estate, website, business card, et cetera? What was the timeline for these activities? I'll answer first because mine's simple. And then Matt, you can explain yours. Ready? Okay. Zero. <laughs> None. No business cards, no website, nothing. I have a lease, an email, a Yahoo email. My business structure looks like this with 16 rental units. One checking account, one saving account, one credit card, one Excel spreadsheet with a tab for expenses and a tab for income. And that's it. Matt? Okay. Um, Lumberjack came from the fact that I worked in the high-tech industry. And, oh, there he is. Look, here comes a celebrity. There he is. Good celebrity. Time. I don't know about that. What's going on, Captain America? What's going on, dude? How you been? I haven't talked to either one of you guys in a little while. I know. I figured you were just, like, you know, off, like, you know, slaying labs or something. Exactly. So, I appreciate that you went with labs because I thought you were going <laughs> somewhere else for that. <laughs> uh, so to answer my to answer my branding question, uh, worked in high tech. I'll, I'll, I'll say the question for Mike because he just jumped yeah, in. Please. Mm -hmm. How did you brand your real estate, your website, your cards, that kind of stuff? So Matt's going to answer and then you're next. So right. how I did it was uh, Lumberjack came from the fact that I made the mistake of wearing my at-home attire, i.e. a flannel down to my office and the rest is history. They're like, oh, look at the lumberjack. I was like, I'm going to lumberjack you up. And so that's kind of how that lumberjack thing came. And then when it was, then I became a landlord and then it was lumberjack landlord. And then there you go. And that plaid is truly me. I want to be ready. Anytime a picnic is ready to break out. I want to be ready to jump on that and make that magic happen. So that's why I continuously wear plaid. Um, and in the wintertime, that is my uniform. I am always in plaid. I have about 30 of those shirts. And so the brand just basically took off from there. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm used to I'm used to running uh, my own businesses. And so branding is something that is important to me. And so that was the brand, um, built it out, worked with a couple of guys to build the website. 
um, cause that's not something I, I can take the time to do. I can do it. I'm just really slow at it. So I have better uses of my time and there's better skilled people out there. And so that's how we built, that's basically how we built out the brand. And so, um, and now we're looking at changing the channel name, but I will still always be the lumberjack landlord cause it's not a made up thing. That's actually what I am for wearing plaid. And millennial Mike. Uh, in all truthfulness, I probably should have put a little bit more thought and effort into my name. <laughs> like if I was going to do real estate related stuff, I probably should have done just like a little bit more thought and effort into something that was slightly more real estate related. You know, I don't know, Mike, the landlord or something like that. Um, do you have a I website? Like, I have no website. I don't have a, I got Instagram. I've do you got have business YouTube. cards. I have business cards from my job as a police officer. <laughs> yeah. So I think that was kind of the point I was making to Tennessee. I think Beth Traverso might have the best answer for that question because she actually has a branded business. Yeah. Like she runs an office and all that kind of stuff. I mean, and I'm going to have a live stream where she explains everything that she does. But as far as real estate goes, we don't have, none of us really have a, like a business mm -hmm. for real estate. Um, it can, it, we can make this as complicated or as simple as we want. N none of us, the three of us, and Michael Zuber included, we are not real estate agents. We don't have our broker's license. We don't have a real estate license. Um, I actually have a long list of reasons why I don't. Um, that's a good question. We're just the wrong. Um, you guys don't have a branded digital business card yet. What is going on? Losers. You understand that a business card would make people... Want to do business with you? I know it's horrible. Have you met people? But <laughs> well, I tell people and all the time that that Instagram is actually important because, like, the younger generation, and I don't mean this with any like being insulting, but like most people, probably thirty and below, would never even consider getting a business card. Everybody contacts everybody via Instagram DMs, and I tell older people all the time, like, dude, if you want to network. <clears throat> if you want to get good at networking, I know it's annoying. You think of little teenage girls taking selfies on Instagram. You have to have an Instagram. You have to curate it to make you look somewhat professional. It's just how people connect nowadays. People used to do email before that. It was, I, I guess, I don't know what was before email. You guys, <laughs> excuse me, fax machine, Paper just fax your buddy, you know, <laughs> interesting. That's cute. Michael snail mail, <laughs> write something out. You know, when Matt was a kid back in the, when was it? Seventies. <laughs> Uh, 1976, right, Matt? I don't remember. Uh, 77 is when I was born, Mike. Oh, yeah. Okay, it was just a random guess. I wait a second. We got a. I'm. I'm pretty sure. Dan, am I allowed to share my screen? Uh, I can. I don't know what happens if I make you the host because. Well, then hold on one second. Let me see. Let me see if I can share. Nope, you disabled it. That's okay. So we won't do this. Boy, Mike, are you lucky? Because I have, I have, I have your professional glamour shot. Uh -oh, oh God, please don't put that on there. I got, I got to change that thing. That picture's been there since I was like twenty-one. Yeah, yeah, I could tell too because you look nothing like that anymore. Uh, yeah, I was always a kid. <laughs> so I'm gonna get through some of these questions as quick as we can. We've got, I'd say, like another twenty minutes or so. So as long as you want. Sorry, I'm putting my email in the chat. To kind of show myself where I was at. Nicholas Massey, since you can only house hack one property a year, do you recommend 25% down when figuring out yield if buying more than one house in the year? So whenever running the numbers, I run it like I did 20 or 25% down, whatever I was doing on the other investments. Um, and while I have house hacked twice, I only did a low down payment one time. My strategy is very different than the Lumberjacks and Zubers. Um, and even the way Millennial Mike invests is very different. My, my goal was the most cash flow with the least number of units. So I put larger down payments, 20 or 25% down on all but one. Yeah, not How about you, me. Matt? Yeah, three. So I was, uh, so FHA didn't really exist when I was doing it, but I could get conventionals at fives and tens. And so that's what I did, five and 10% down payments. Um, but I would base it on my actual down payment because I would be there for a year. That was going to be the rent. And I could figure exactly like, instead of trying to trick myself with some, you know, change number in the account or change number on the spreadsheet, it was just, this is what it is. I put 5% in the deal. I put 10% in the deal. That's how much money I had in the deal. And a lot of times for me, 
I was because prices started to rise in like 2012 and I was still hacking one, one a year at that point with prices starting to rise, I could do the work. I would actually get a return on my capital, getting the work done. The appraisal would actually give me my money back that I put into the deal. And so then I would run with that new number, making sure that I wasn't going negative, but that I still had a good return. So that was, it really is market dependent on, on, you know, how, if you can do that refi at that point, rates were fairly steady, but values were going up aggressively on redone properties because so many of the properties we were comparing to were foreclosures. And instantly if an appraiser knew if they had any salt whatsoever, they were like, I can't even count that property. If it's sold, it's in a, it's a foreclosure, which is, which has no bearing on the number for a real deal. So I would do it. I did it. I, I did nine high house hacks in 13 years. Dang. It's a lot of moving. Like you Mike, your wife done do. one and peer pressure is going to get him into his second. Oh, 100%. I absolutely need to do another one. Um, I think I actually, when I finish my two project houses I'm working on right now and I get the cash back out of those ones, I think I'll probably look to, to do another house hack. Um, so yeah, so I've done one house hack and I put 5% down in a conventional loan. I could have done an FHA, but the conventional loan program worked better for me in this particular case, but it was 5% down. Um, if you're, I mean, I guess there's two schools of thought. Keep as much money in your own pocket as possible, but have a higher monthly payment um, or put the full 20% down. Maybe have that monthly payment low. It's a little easier to cash flow. Um, and I guess there may be an opportunity for you to do one or the other, depending on where you're at. When I was here in Washington, my $450,000 duplex, I did not even have enough for a 20% down. So being able to have the option to put 5% down just to get in and get on the property ladder and then benefit from the appreciation worked out great for me. But now I would probably be looking to do 20% down for better cash flow. So you know, it might be a different answer for you at a different time. Yeah. Yeah. But That's pretty much exactly it. how mine went. First sure. duplex was 5% down. Then the fourplex, I did 20% down. Yeah, the challenge is, is that what you realize is over time, because you're going to get that owner rock rate that you're locked in forever. The nice thing is, is that five and 10 years down the road, you're making so much money that now you can't get away from paying taxes on those dollars. So that's, right. so that's where for me, that was one of the things that I looked five, 10 years down the road. And I said, I don't want to have to pay. I would rather have slim margins up front and recognize in 10, 15, 20 years I'm going to get to where I get to, but I want to pay as little in taxes on that income as I possibly could because I couldn't depreciate the asset based on my income. Interesting. It's because you still have a job. A job. Yes, with an and terrible thing. You can fix that. It's true. Alec, howdy. <laughs> and howdy, Eric. Market mm -hmm. is still hot in Charlotte between hedge funds and professional investors. How do you get competitive as a small investor? The so my question would be, how are you finding your deals? Yeah. Do you have just one agent searching and are you seeing a very limited number of them? For me, it takes at least three with auto searches set up. Uh, for the last two years, speed was our friend. Get an offer in before the person realized they were going to be inundated with offers. Hmm. Now, if your market is still that hot because it's real estate is local, speed might still be your friend. Look at doing a larger earnest, but keeping your contingencies like inspection report, appraisal, contingency in there so you can back out without losing your earnest money. Steal from the lumberjack landlord. Try to find out what matters to the seller. Get a communication between your two agents. Are they looking for a place to stay for a few months? Is there, you know, is what matters the most to the seller? If you can figure that out, it makes it a lot easier. Mm -hmm. um, Look at open door and offer pad. See if they do business in that market. I'm pretty sure they do be looking at those listings that are starting to hit uh, 90 days plus, you will likely be able to aggressively offer on those deals. Don't be ashamed. If you're not embarrassed by your first number, you aren't trying hard enough. So make sure that you're being aggressive there. Like Dion said, ask what the three things are that they want in open door and offer pads case. We just want to sell it. That's their answer. So they just want to get basically out of the property. The other thing too is in those areas, because that is basically the tech triangle. Um, you just gotta, the, the challenge there is that will continue to rise there because that was a major investor focus. And so just let the game come to you, let stuff age out. They have a likely a stricter criteria. So they're not touching the stuff that's pre 1979. So anything that was built before, you know, built in the 50s, 60s and 70s, they are likely not touching. Uh, actual investors like you are touching it, but none of Wall Street, no hedge funds, none of those guys touch anything older than 79. 
In fact, most of them, it's like 19, I think 89 or 90, but 79 is an easy cutoff. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, a couple things. Uh, I was just trying to catch up in the chat and I did see somewhere in here, CJ Underwood said closing for a seller financing deal. Don't know if you guys got to that point, but congrats, dude. That's super cool. Um, to the question that was asked earlier, um, I just had a conversation with a coworker of mine, a police officer. He, I helped him get two rentals in the Gary, Indiana area last year. Uh, he's been saving up to buy his third one. He's ready to buy his third one. Now he doesn't look at the market every day, like I encourage him to do, but you know, he's now looking actively again. He's like, yeah, I'm seeing there's a lot of stuff sitting on the market for longer than last year. I'm like, yeah, dude, things have changed. Things have changed. And I was like, do not offer list price. You look at any of these houses that have been sitting there for 30 days, if they're listed for 120, offer them hundred. Because I bet you someone's going to say yes. You might have to write it 30 times, but mm -hmm. one of those 30 is the guy who has to sell and he's going to be excited. Someone's mm -hmm. willing to finally buy. So things are changing. Make a bunch of offers. I like that. I hadn't heard that phrase before. You should be embarrassed by the offer you're making. Yeah, yeah that's that's good advice right there. I like that. Yeah. Yep. I, I uh, made an offer this morning. Um, list price 420, my offer 390. Been on the market three days. Three days. Didn't take 10, didn't take 30. They're considering. I love it. So <laughs> two days without an offer here is like unheard of. Yeah. Is yeah, that a so. duplex? What is it? Duplex. Mm -hmm. Nice. I love it. Love it. Howdy, Gavin. Cameron. Howdy. Question. And I will give this to Millennial Mike. Dion, when you say your first year you make 10 to 12% on your investment, does that mean you make 10% of the total cost of the property? Can you elaborate? So if you can explain cash on cash return. Yeah, it's pretty simple. So you're going to take the total amount of money that you put in to purchase the property. That would be your down payment. That's going to be your closing costs. That's going to be your appraisal fee, whatever, however much money it costs for you to actually buy that property. Then you're going to look at your, what you're bringing in monthly. Let's just say you bring in a thousand dollars monthly, 30% uh, right off the top. You're going to set aside for your property manager, not in Dion's case, but property manager, vacancies, maintenance, repairs, things like that. So you're going to knock some of that rent off. Obviously, then you have to pay your property taxes, your insurance, your principal and interest on the mortgage. So from that thousand dollars you brought in, you might only make 250 bucks a month in true, pure profit. That $250 a month multiplied out times 12 for the entire year, call it 3,500 bucks. I'm doing quick math here. 3,500 bucks divided by your original amount of money to purchase the property is uh, how you figure out what your cash on cash return or your yield is. That's how you do the calculation there. And obviously the number is going to be different in your area. You be, might be making 500 bucks a month of pure profit and spending 300,000 on a property, something like that. But that's the rough way of getting a cash on cash return. Nice. Perfect. So Cameron, simple math. Let's say it cost you, you invested a hundred thousand dollars, your down payment, your closing costs, the money to make it ready was a hundred thousand dollars. If you profit $10,000 next year, that's a 10% return. If you profit $15,000, it's a 15% return. So how much did it cost to get it? How much do you profit? Divide the profit by the cost. And 12 times 250 is 3000. Okay, I, dude, I was going off the top of my head on a rant. Or I was like, so was I. Something. <laughs> that, was, that was a great answer. I mean, Hater. you nailed all, right. all the terms. <laughs> if you want to see a, a, a nicely, like with the pop-up numbers and everything, you can check out my channel where I have videos where it's the true. numbers are right there. I checked yes. my own math. <laughs> Gavin, again, um, I think he said hi. Yep. My market is lagging behind what you and Zoomer are seeing. So real estate is local. More days on market, et cetera. Anything worth buying is still going over ask. Any ideas on finding my next hack other than waiting? How are you finding your properties? Mm -hmm. um, over ask was 52% of all deals in like April and May. It's 38% of all deals now. So it, it is reducing, but it is local, depending on what's going on in your local market. Having one agent do an auto search and, and definitely looking on Redfin and Zillow is, is dated info that doesn't help. I've seen my deals show up three months later as pending when I've closed three months ago. I would have at least three agents have auto searches set up to find you deals. And if you're not seeing days on market pile up, then we go back to speed is your friend, highest higher earnest money, trying to find out what matters to the seller. Yes. My handyman is calling me and I said, make sure that's not important because he doesn't ever call. As far <laughs> as what matters for the, the seller, dude, that, that can really be the, 
like the, for instance, I have another friend who's moving because he's moving for a job. He's a police officer like me. He's getting transferred to the other side of the state. He got a couple of different offers on this house he just listed. He was willing to accept the lower offer because they were willing to give him six weeks of living in that property. His transfer doesn't go into effect until November. So he was going to have to be stuck renting or in a hotel or something for six weeks with his family and his two kids would have been a huge mess. Or, or you let me live in my house for six weeks and I'll accept $10,000 left off the sale price. So if you can figure out what those push button issues are, you know, you can get a good deal. Yep. I've won deals with leasebacks, with buying somebody a dumpster, with hiring movers for them, with renting a, uh, a U-Haul truck. I've won deals with all sorts of things just based on asking the question. Stop guessing. Ask. Just ask. It's I call it the reverse offer strategy. Just ask. Yeah, it's another one of the reasons why I don't have my real estate license is you're not allowed to send love letters. That's right. But I can send a letter saying what matters to you. Yep, 100%. I'm not an agent. I don't have to know the rules. That's right. James J. Howdy. Um, what would you consider a safe amount to have in reserves for a single family purchase? Also, is there a reserve cap per property when you would cease adding to the reserves and reinvest elsewhere? Gavin then almost answers the question by saying a safe reserve amount is generally 15% of gross rents. That is how much we're setting aside into the reserves out of the gross rents. Uh, the, yeah, Matt and Mike might have different answers for reserves, but for me, it's scaled with the size of my portfolio. When I had seven or less units, $10,000 was a nice round number. I didn't try to base it on the value of the properties. I thought that will cover a roof, a hot water heater, a couple exactly. months, no rent, any mm -hmm. one of those issues. When I had more than seven units and the property started to get bigger in number, I raised it to 30,000 while I was working. When I quit working, I raised it to 50,000 because I don't have the, the W-2 income. So nice round, don't overthink it. This can be made as complex or as simple as you want. Lenders are going to generally want a certain amount in reserves for you to get the next loan. Um, my lenders have all said, except for one, they've all said three months, principal, interest, taxes, and insurance sitting in one account. I had one lender that said, you need to have 4% of the gross value of your properties in an account. So never worked with that lender again. So I don't even know how to get the math on that. So I'm going <laughs> And then Chester said this one of Zuber shows. 23 to 25, maybe even 26 is going to be a nice once in a lifetime opportunity for disciplined people who have a chance to acquire assets with a good deal. Yep. Prepare, be ready. Yep. Be looking yep. every day. Yep. Gavin to Alizette, you can run the math how you want. I would be wary of extra closing fees on FHA. Use local government website to real estate. So we talked about the taxes. Con, howdy. Binder strategy worked for me. Got a $200 rent increase. Thank you. Excellent. That's awesome. Chester, that's not to say buy assets as other times, definitely do, but opportunities to do deals with motivated sellers is likely to be commonplace. Mm -hmm. Any assessor's website should have tax. Yep, Brock, howdy. What do you typically do about lawn care at your properties? Do you ever hire someone to do it or do you always put it in the lease for the tenants? And if so, how does that work with a shared front yard? Matt. I hire a teenage kid. I have workman's comp insurance and they are thrilled. They can do all of my lawns in 10 hours and I pay him $250. So my lawn it's care. 25 bucks an hour. No kidding. That's why for a he's teenager, that's to do good it. money. Exactly. It's great money for him. Actually, no. So we had, we had somebody that was doing that, but they were doing so this one is, I think he's 17 or 18 bucks an hour, but we had one that was 25, but they were doing like shrub stuff. So I pay him 17 bucks an hour to basically do all the lawns. You can do them in about 10 hours. And then every, uh, like once a month, I have somebody go in and they send me a bill for kind of cleaning up all the shrub work and things like that. But you have to do that. I actually have workman's comp. That way, if he ever had a problem, ever had an issue, ever had a whatever happened, we got him covered. We got him taken care of. What do you do, Mike? Uh, I mean, I've got an amalgamation of different things. In my house hack, I mow my own lawn, handle the tenant side. Um, I have some older tenants in Gary that I don't ask them to try to mow their lawn. We just get a service out there to take care of it. And it's just tacked on as part of the bill. Um, and then for most of the houses I have them where they have to take care of their own snow because snow is a big thing in the Midwest and then their own snow in their lawns. Cool. So um, I'm lazy and wouldn't touch a lawnmower 
for any amount of money. You bought <laughs> it smells so good to cut the grass. That's a dad thing to do. I love cutting the grass. You're both bombs. You're a lumberjack. You cut trees. You can't cut grass. Nope. I will go and be on the elliptical for twice the time it would take to mow the lawn and feel better at the end of it than doing Dude. the lawn. Dude, so I got all of my three, leases three have lawns. the tenants do it even on okay, what's that, that makes sense. Yeah. I didn't say mow them all. I said I, I got lawn. 43 lawns. Like which one should I do? <laughs> the one in all your of my house. duplexes and triplex and single family, the lease is clearly defined with a little sketched image of this is your responsible area. The fourplex is the only one where it's not clearly defined. So for that one, I pay $200 a month for a service. The tenants pay for that. Yes. Not me. Um, well, they pay for it out of rent, right? Correct. Right. It's not yes. an added service. Right. Got it. Just check. Matt, long time listener, first time commenter. Your content oh. is very much appreciated, Dion. Every time I see that. Thank you, Matt. Howdy. I think uh, I hear Tom like it say it in my head. And Gavin, the 1% rule has been out since 2009. Just perform full analysis, gross rent, expenses, cash on to close, fix. Lauren, I am enjoying my books. Thanks for your answers. Awesome. It's awesome to meet you and to come up by. See if I can burn through these really quick before I get you guys here too long. Oh, you're fine. Everyone's in bed right here. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> Monica, I got a HELOC with 2.9% rate for one year. Would you use it to pay off a property to increase my cash flow or buy another property, the HELOC? I'm able to pay it in that year and current rate 5.5%. All right, for one year. So it's locked for one year hmm. and then the rate changes. I don't like adjustable rate anything. I think I would focus and pay it off like the HELOC. Keep the fixed rate debt, but because yeah, we don't know what rates will be next yeah. year. Right. They could be 13%. They could be 2%. Yep. Yeah. Anything, any of the variable rate stuff that I have, the shortest term was five or seven, five and seven years. So understanding that I was taking on risk with the variable rate, I will pay that down more aggressively in case something comes up, but the rate was so good that it was so much different than the fixed rate. Like I could have gone a DSCR loan, but it was two points higher. It was two more points to close. So when it was all said and done, if I just focused on applying those dollars towards the next five years, I end up much further ahead than having gone with a 30 year fixed. Do you have any adjustable rate loans, Mike? I have a HELOC myself. Um, I took a HELOC out so that I could buy properties, remodel them, and then do a cash out refinance and turn it into fixed debt. I would I will take a HELOC that I can turn into fixed rate debt, but I don't think I would take fixed rate debt and turn that into a HELOC. Why would you want to pay off a property so it'll cash flow better, get rid of your fixed rate debt that cannot be adjusted and change that into an adjustable rate debt structure? It doesn't make sense to me. You're going to get $100,000 and you have an option for a fixed rate or an unfixed rate. Leave it there. If you want to do something with your HELOC, I'm not against it. I got two properties I purchased. I'm currently remodeling doing the burst strategy with. It's a complex strategy. You, it's very difficult to do it successfully into a rising interest rate environment as I'm getting my high tanned by the quote I got today for 7%. When I ran my numbers eight months ago, I was like, yeah, 4%. I'm still going to turn out all right, but certainly sucks. So I would not be jumping into doing that unless you're an experienced investor with other foundation of successful rentals that can cover you if you unfortunately calculate wrong or the market shifts underneath you. So that, that's my thoughts on it. I 100% agree. Yep. Uh, you nail it right there. Chester, I think it makes sense to do what Millennial Mike did for newbies to REI and to house hack in a high cost of living area. Yep. Yeah. And then invest out of state. Totally agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then after you've lived there for a year or two, house hack again. Yes. yes, sir. Jimena yes. Anderson. Hola, mija. ¿Cómo está? Good evening, everyone. I'm really enjoying the live and wise advice. Dion, thank you for sharing your experience in real estate and life. Thank you. At least fire me now. Fire me, please. Thinking this is a good year to raise the rent because it might be hard to make adjustments next year during a potential <clears throat> recession. What do you think? How do your rents compare to area average? The, the end of last year and the beginning of this year, I did the binder strategy across the board and saw 20 to 28% rent increases at tenants request. So this was definitely a year to do a rent increase. And I had three leases in my fourplex that don't come up until the next few months. So I'll be doing that again. 
So I, and I my guess would be you're not doing my guess would be Dan, you're not doing those again. You're not doing binder strategy next year, right? No, no, I, I would no, I not unless you. like somehow things Agreed. went up another forty percent and whatever yep. happened to the world to do that. Agreed. Agreed. Um, so no, not for at least two years probably. Yep. And even then, it's probably just going to be like a five percent increase without a binder. Yeah, the first two years, like 2020, 20 and 20, 2020 and twenty twenty one, we didn't really do a whole lot of rent raises unless it was brand new units. And so twenty twenty two, we've had to make up for it. We've just said, yeah, the increase. I mean. We've binder strategy and we've also just said, this is what the new rent is. If we really liked you. My neighbor is practicing music. I can hear. Or, or I can hear it too. Out. Yeah. I was wondering what that was. <laughs> like, yeah. Interesting. I've, I've never heard them before. Playing bass. Perks of house hacking. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. I can rock out to this. Watch me get a, what are they demonetized? Cause they recognize the song in the background. Cotton strike. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, Chester to Tom cash flow. What's up? Real estate freaks. Howdy. Howdy Johnny Andy. Ramirez. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This info in for Johnny Ramirez, right? Cash flow, Johnny. Let's mix that one up. What if the new housing fair market value is more than most of the current rents? Yeah. That's why that's why single family houses don't work in my neighborhood in my area and haven't for over a decade. That's right. It, it does kind of entertain me that people go, I'm going to buy next year when prices are lower and continue to pay someone else's mortgage between now and then. Right. Trying to get through this flash and, of light. And look at with most FMRs, look at what your local housing authority is doing, because even with those FMRs being up anywhere from, you know, eight to 14 and a half percent, most most housing authorities are doing another 10 percent override. So just check with your local housing authority. Because it's probably that eight to 14 plus another 10. Tom says, thanks, Matt. Love when you use easy peasy numbers. You make things work. <laughs> I'm happy to. Ryan, howdy. Tried to super chat, but there's a glitch on my end. Still doing audiobook giveaway. Same so for me. I start. Go ahead, Mike. I was trying to super chat too. And it was like yeah. the YouTube so, didn't let me do it. Ironically, and I can prove this by somebody going and watching the beginning of the video. Before we realized there was a problem with Super Chats, I said, in this Super Chat, I'm giving away an audio book, uh, 15 Conversations with Real Estate Millionaires. And if you already have it, you can choose another, preferably finance book. And I was going to go on comments, not Super Chats. So I have 20-sided mm -hmm. dice if like two people showed up, 60-sided dice if more people showed up. And then it looks like I'm going to be using a 100-sided dice to figure out who wins this, whether it's a Super Chat or just a regular chat. And I'll have to count this at the end of the video, um, which will be a very boring last minute, believe me. <laughs> Um, likely matches the first few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Chester, check out post on how the chat book giving. Okay, that was the beginning. Yep. Tom to Mike, did you borrow Matsky's network or grow your own? What, what was the question you glitched out? Matsky's network or grow your own? Oh, okay. I see it right there. Okay. Yeah. Great question. A um, little bit of both. A little bit of both. Uh, you know, Michael Zuber told me one of the things I should always do on my own is try to build my own network. So I was constantly doing that. But to the best of my ability, yeah, I want to copy and paste somebody else's success into my life where I can. So Maskey from Maskey Finance used a turnkey property provider to buy his first like four properties there. I bought my first property with that same turnkey provider. But then I started realizing there was stuff on the MLS that was cheaper and also remodeled. And so I, I met the real estate agent. He stole her from me. Um, uh, I stole his property manager, but then found another one on my own. So, I mean, yeah, if you can find other people that are recommended, that's the number one thing I recommend when you're getting started out of state investing is you want to build a network. And typically you're going to grow that network by finding other investors in the area who aren't trying to sell you something and are just trying to help you. And then you take their referrals and if you like them, use them. And if not, find your own. Beth Traverso chimes in from the question earlier on how do we do our branding? She says, I work with a marketing firm for my real estate sales brand. It is always evolving and I have a lot of money invested in it, but that's completely separate from my investing side. I wouldn't want anyone to get sidetracked on branding instead of doing the important work to get going and investing. Totally agree. Those are two separate things. Being an agent, working in real estate and investing in real estate. Um, And that's where CJ talks about his first uh, seller financing deal. 
Good for him. Good job. You stud. Good job, yeah. buddy. Good job. Mad 76, 4321 strategy question. What's yeah. the restriction on 4444 newbie here? Great question. That's a really good question, Mad. This is really good. So there can be no restriction. Usually, right now, the rules are that you can go 4444, which I love that you're even thinking that way. Most people don't have the stones to do 4444. So love that you're thinking that way. The one caveat is typically you have to be able to justify going from a four to another four that there are two or three justifiable reasons of why you're doing it. But it can be a reason like this. I'm moving closer to work. My, my wife needs to move closer to work. I want to change school districts. Um, any number of these kind of things put together. The, the new building is newer and doesn't require as much maintenance. And I want to be in a place where I'm not having to do all this maintenance. Almost all of those things will be approved by an underwriter. The only thing that I would tell you is you must, must, must be honest, be honest. I don't advocate lying at any point in this process. You get caught, it's mortgage fraud. Don't do that. So you can absolutely do 444. And like I said, work, but also work with like a Matt, the mortgage guy, Matt, the mortgage guy, his guys are all trained a lot alike where they understand this process and they understand what, what the underwriter is looking for to make sure to give you guidance as to be able to tell your story and likely they will not withhold it. The only danger that you're likely able to run into is the sustainability rule, which is uh, rent percentage versus what your down payment is. And so just, you can look up the sustainability rule. I actually did a video on it, but if you look it up, um, that's re- that's the really important thing when you're looking at 444 four, and you're going from one to the next. The, the really good thing to distinguish when you're talking about the 4321 uh, restrictions is it's almost always for FHA. Mm-hmm. If you're going conventional, they don't care if you go single family to duplex to single family to right. fourplex if you could save the down payment. Yeah. It's, it's just because I actually went from duplex house act to fourplex house act, uh, moved further away from work, don't have school age kids at that point, um, like all the things that FHA would have had a problem with and just went conventional. And if they do care, this is, you must just shop your mortgage. There are some conventional lenders that actually care about that. Just shop, just yeah. shop. Don't, don't be married to that one vendor. Just make sure you're shopping it and getting the answer that you need. Chester says to Tom, he's making offers on some really good cash flowing properties, but I'm still getting outbid by Californians moving here. So just wait for them, Chester, to see the weather. And then buy it from them next year when they have to leave. <laughs> then Gavin gives a, a good answer on the 444. Um, Chester's in the Navy, so he uses a lot of abbreviations. <laughs> Makes sense. Tom Kine, I have a challenge. If any successful one rental at a time students think it's good, I would donate a course on these guys' channel if anyone wants to match or discuss on Facebook take some thinking to see how that would work. That would be great. I did a couple of videos where I gave away a course on Zuber's channel, on Zuber's, of Zuber's courses. Mm-hmm. Dividend Dave, there are great markets outside Charlotte. I had to broaden my horizons. Right? Yes. Yep. Uh, yeah, Charlotte's kind, of, Charlotte's kind of like the banking capital and uh, Raleigh is like a tech tech hub now. So... Yeah, it's great. They're great areas. They're great markets. And I think I've been to the East Coast twice. No, I've been to Florida twice in the last year. So three times now. See. I don't know anything about the East Coast. Yes, it's a lot of fun. It's all Siberia to me. <laughs> Raleigh's no warmer than where you are, pal. <laughs> Surf Marco has a question that maybe Matt can answer. Why don't core investment firms buy anything built before 1979? I, I have an idea, but Matt. So it's um, usually it's lead paint, liability of lead paint. Um, The other thing that with a lot of those investment firms is they don't have a cost of money. So you have a cost of money because you're going to need a mortgage or you're, and you're paying percentages for them. It is, I park 300,000 bucks in there. I have my maintenance firm that's in that area, take care of it. And they don't have to worry about any of the liabilities of all the different things that can come up with lead paint, with asbestos, and you get to largely stay away from all of the big stuff, um, except for polypropylene uh, piping. 
that's the only thing that is kind of like mid 80s, early 90s and Federal Pacific uh, breaker panels. But that's something that's can easily be disqualified. So usually it's a lead paint liability issue. Yeah, that would be my my guess. Lead paint, asbestos, that kind yep. of stuff. Yep, they want that newer construction because there's less liability. Michael Smith asks, if it's too late to win this, we're going to wrap up here in a few minutes to win the Audible giveaway. Mike, I will be doing that soon. It's going to be a dice roll based on comments. Um, Michael Smith, thanks for showing up. Let's see. Let's see if I see any other questions. There was one question down here at the bottom. I have a condo that I that I want to sell because I want to buy something else. Would you recommend to sell it as seller financing or regular sell? I'm in Los Angeles City. Uh, Monica, if you sell it seller financing, you might not get a big lump of sum up front right. to be able to invest in another property. One of the reasons we go for a, a mortgage with the buyer or cash from the buyer is because you get that money to redeploy. Uh, so seller financing might not work if your goal is to buy something else. You also want to be very careful with seller financing, especially if it's going to be an owner-occupied home, because then you have homestead rights, all these other things and evictions. It gets very dicey. That is a much more advanced strategy. I would just really caution you to make sure you really understand all you're saying yes to. So I'm going to figure out who won the book based on this many comments. It's going to be the 100 side of die. Too many for the 60. Too many for the 20. Nerds live here. <laughs> um, last comment from CJ Underwood. Because I like this comment, I want to get it out there. I'll be a guest on one of your channels within a year. Speaking it into existence now. Love it. I think you should be on all three. Yeah. Here we go. Good luck to everybody. And I am going to have to take the time. And it's going to be in the order that the comments showed up on my screen. What other order would it be in? <laughs> it's a good point. <laughs> 31. 31. Mr. 30. 31. So 31 from the top. Hey, while he's counting, Michael Vaughn in Newport asked, thanks for taking the time to do this chat, guys. Also, if somebody could write a book entitled Networking for Introverts, I would like that book, Should I Win? I tell you what, I might do a live stream on Networking for Introverts. And I feel like Matt should too, because Matt and I had a conversation once about he was very introverted as a kid. Yeah. I was very self-conscious. I was a kid who was like too afraid to get up and blow my nose in class because I was like, oh, it's going to be loud and embarrassing. Like when I was a kid, I hated that stuff. So, but somehow here we are on YouTube chatting it up. So yeah, maybe we can figure out how to do a, do a show on how to get out of your shell, how to conversate with people. So Dion, yeah. back to you. Con confidence comes from competence. It's almost so, like I've heard that somewhere. Uh, right. Those so four words. Yes. Yeah. You, you, you say that all the time. <laughs> Like I said, it's almost like I've heard that somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I, I figured you were still counting the 31. <laughs> I ran out of toes. <laughs> Michelle oh. Mayer. Congratulations. Oh, Michelle. My email one more time in the chat. Reach out to me. And uh, cool. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for hanging out with us. Thanks, Millennial Mike. They can find you here on YouTube. Literally just go to your Google search bar and put in Millennial Mike. That's true. And then Lumberjack Landlord, they can find you right here on YouTube too. And both of you are on Instagram and I'm not because I'm not a teenager. <laughs> Shut up, Dion. <laughs> Someday I will be on. You have no idea. Mike and I tag you all the time. I Instagram. tag you on Instagram all the time. <laughs> no, have I, I have an Instagram account that's tied to Facebook. So I put stuff on Facebook. Yeah. I have to be really careful though, because um my family is a bunch of catholics and because i am no longer catholic i i'm the, the black sheep of the family and so my early facebook stuff is all bashing on all religions i was unilateral i didn't pick one over the other um so a lot of that was getting duplicated on instagram and i was like oh that's not who i am because it was to mess with my family not because i cared about what anybody else was doing yes understood until my next video Thanks for coming to my Dion talk.